to all of my people! Welcome to a new Vagabonds Chronicles podcast! I am here to tell you a new story about being a traveler and a vagabond. So, to kick this story off, I want to tell you stories about hotel horror stories, or Airbnb horror stories, or Verbo horror stories, or whatever booking site you want to use. Horror stories of staying in a place that you don't know what it is until you actually get there. Why? Well, I'm sure as you can see, uh, we're in a new spot today. So, audio viewers, view with your eyeballs. One side of me, I have this cool little lamp that looks like something out of Alice in Wonderland. Behind me, I have a painting of like a First Nations woman, it looks like. I also have some sort of a cool wooden stick on my head as an awesome hat and I'm in this really cool rocking chair so if you see me rocking it's because I'm in this very cool rocking chair I'm in a new place as you probably guessed and it's actually a super awesome place and I am stoked about it like rarely do I get a place this nice when I travel so yeah thumbs up um and with that like I want to start off by talking about some horror stories because they're not always this nice and when I stepped into this place, like the first thing that ran into my mind was, what's going to go wrong? And I'm like, no, no, stop projecting negative energy in the world. Everything could just go right. So long ago, when I started this whole idea of kind of solo travel, exploring to see what I could do without camping. Camping is great. You just go somewhere, pop up a tent pop up a sleeping bag in the back of your car, just sleep somewhere, and drive. But, as I was getting to more complex destinations, there wasn't always a place to camp. Sometimes it was snowy or rainy or windy, and I wanted to explore a different type of traveling. So, this first story takes place when Airbnb was first starting up. And I will call them out because it happened on Airbnb, and why not? So whenever Airbnb was first starting up, you know, everyone was aware of the scams that were going on. Um, my day job is in technology and, you know, I'm very aware of a lot of scams that go on. So I try to do my research on places so I don't get internet scammed. You know, just doing my normal duty as an internet civilian. Well, I was going to this place that was about 10 hours away from where I was living at the time. And I decided to drive there. So after a very long day of driving, I was approaching, pulling up to uh, where the GPS was saying my Airbnb was going to be. And I'm looking for the address, and I'm looking for the address, and I'm like, cool, it's just like two more houses down. Because I figured out how the numbers of the houses were counting. And I pull up to where it should have been, and the road ended. You see, whatever the hosts did to that site they made the Airbnb booking actually not exist. The address didn't exist. The house didn't exist. Where the address was, was the end of a dead road. So contact Airbnb support. And I'm like, hey, there's a dead end road here. What do I do? And they're like, oh no, the host, you know, just had guests there. You're in the wrong spot. And I'm like, okay, I'll go ask a local. So I go drive up to a local gas station. I'm like, hey, I'm looking for this place. And the gas station attendant tells me the exact same spot I was at. But then he's like, yeah, that number doesn't exist, though, down that road. Are you sure that's the right house number? Couldn't message your host at all. Airbnb couldn't contact the host. And so basically, Airbnb told me it was my fault and that I was in the wrong place and they refused to give me a refund. Although the locals were like, yeah, no, that does not exist. Um, so it was kind of unfortunate. It was a very expensive place I had booked. But then I'm like, you know what? I have two options here. Option one, I get back in my car and drive for 10 hours. Now, since I'd already been up for about 14 hours, that probably wasn't a very smart option. Option two, drive around and see what else is here. And it's only money. I'm going to make that money back someday. Maybe I'll have to cut back on, you know, the groceries that I buy or cut down on the alcohol or cut down on something else. But it's only money. So I drove down the road a little bit and I was looking for more places. I stopped into a couple of different hotels and they're like, no, sorry, we're already full. You can come back in two days. We'll have room then. And I'm like, yeah, I need room for today. Well, 
I pulled into this one hotel and it was such an awesome experience. So, you know, I was a little bit, I was exhausted. Um, I was nervous. I wasn't sure where I was going to stay for the night. It had been one of the first times I was stranded as well. And so I would not been in this situation before. And the uh, very cute server uh, who picked me up whenever, not picked me up, the very cute server who uh, greeted me at the door of this hotel was like, hey, come on in, you know, have a drink. Let's figure this out and we are going to find you an awesome place to stay. And I was just like, but I can't drink and drive. He's like, fine, stay here for two hours, have a beer, and then get back in your car and we'll find you a place in the next two hours. Which was just like the most fantastic thing I needed. So get in his uh, restaurant and he serves me a super fresh beer. And then I ordered some food and I'm like, okay, I feel better. I've had a great meal. I've had a really delicious cold beer. Let's figure this out. So he hooked me up with Wi-Fi, and I'm on the internet trying to find a place. And I finally found a place. Now their phone didn't connect, but I asked the guy, I was like, is this place real? And he's like, yeah, they're just always out on the grounds and they don't have someone manning the desks. And I'm like, cool. So I drive up and I'm like, hey, waiting at the little entrance for a while because no one manning the desks. And they're like, oh, hi, do you have a reservation? No, but my Airbnb canceled out on me because the address doesn't exist and I was wondering if you guys have anything here. And they're like, oh, was it yada, yada, yada address? And I'm like, how did you know? And they're like, oh, yeah, we have two other residents here staying with us who were also at that alleged address as well. And they had one place left. And they're like, yeah, sorry, it's a little bit more expensive than it usually is. This is our nice honeymoon suite. And I'm just like, sign me up. So I go into this, uh, I was staying in the middle of this very small woods in uh, Vancouver Island. Now, if you've been to Vancouver Island before, you know what I'm talking about. But there are these tiny little towns that are just scattered throughout the island. Some are on the coast, some are in the middle of the island. Beautiful places. And so they're like, yeah, we have one place left, Honeymoon. And I'm just like, Honeymoon Suite, Vancouver Island, I'm sold. Hand them over a large amount of money because I was staying there for about, I think, three or four days. And I go into this cabin and it was this nice wood cabin. Everything smelled of fresh wood. Um, there was a massive bathtub. There was like a little jacuzzi hot tub type thing. There was a loft bed that I could sleep in or there was a bed downstairs if a loft got too hot. Full kitchen, full everything. So many windows that just opened to let all of the breeze in. It was the most amazing establishment I could ever dream of. Like even in fact now, when I'm looking for places to stay, I still remember this place. I go in, I have the best night's sleep ever. They come the, around the next door, knock at my door. And, Hi, do you need anything? And I'm just like, oh yeah, I don't have any coffee. I don't have any food. And I'm just like, well, where can I go buy coffee? And they're like, oh, well, it's Sunday and shops aren't open but we can give you some stuff from our kitchen. So they bring me over this massive basket of like coffee and eggs and bread and some meat and vegetables. So I could just cook myself some food for the day. Cook myself some food, went on an awesome walk, did a bunch of meditation and I'm just like sitting there in the forest, taking in all of the serenity and peace and quiet. And you know, as I was driving back, um, after my stay there was over, I was just like, this has turned out so cool. The trip cost me way more than I wanted that trip to cost me. But the amount of experience that I had, the random encounters that I found with the nicest people who didn't laugh at me for booking a scam room. They're just like, yeah, we can help. You know, you don't have food. Here's food out of our kitchen. Have some food out of our kitchen. So this was one of the first experiences that I had where things just work out sometimes whenever you're stranded and whenever you're stranded in a horror story. Now, there are some times that things don't work out so well. And that's what we're going to talk about next. So one of the times that things didn't work out so well, I have a whole list of stuff on my phone, you guys. So that's what I'm looking at my phone. One of the times things didn't work out so well. I was in Cornwall in the UK. So Cornwall is on the west coast of southern England. And it's kind of the 
I guess the posh area where people go on vacation. Um, I went to this area over COVID because it was one of the few areas in England that didn't believe COVID was real. And they had hotels open, they were booking, they were having a bunch of events and that sort of stuff. I'm a believer that COVID is real. I've had COVID four times and I've lost my smelling four times and COVID's real for me anyway. If you don't believe COVID's real, that's fine. But this town didn't believe COVID was real. Hotels were open. I needed to get out of London. London was is a city of concrete and I needed some green, some forest, some fresh sea air. So I booked a room there, got on the train and went on like a three and a half, four hour train ride to get to Cornwall. And then I didn't actually get all the way there because I couldn't get to where I was going. Rented a car and drove, you know, for the rest hour, hour and a half that I had to get to Cornwall. Pull up to Cornwall and I'm at the hotel counter and they're like, ah, oh, we must take your temperature. Okay, take my temperature. Oh, you don't need to wear a mask. And I'm like, you guys really don't believe in COVID, do you? Take off my mask. And then, you know, there were some people who weren't taking their mask off. They were laughed at the entire time. They were mocked at. And I'm just like, I don't want to pull that much attention to my face. Mask off. Um, they give me the room keys to my room. And I booked, I think, like a double, a double room for two people. Sea view. Which usually is, you know, a little bit nicer room. A little bit more room to spread out. Um, I'd plan on staying there, I think, for a week. Because I was just, you know, going to work from Cornwall. We were working remote anyway. They said they had Wi-Fi. I wanted some room to do little workouts in my room, you know, and a double room usually gives you that much space. So I get up to my room and there is a twin bed, single bed. There is room next to that single bed, enough for another single bed to fit if that was there. In the bathroom, it's like the width of another single bed. So effectively, I'm in the size of a room as big as like a massive California King size bed. The smallest hotel room that I've rented in my life for 300 pounds a day. Like insane. I don't know what they did to the prices here. I'm in the room and I'm just like, okay, it's only for a week. You're out of London. You have a car. You have a beach. You're so much hiking here. It'll be fine. So the first night I went for a little hike, get into bed around 10 o'clock. I'm a morning person and I usually get into bed a little bit early, you know, pop on some YouTube to just listen to it, going to sleep or whatever. And then next to me, I hear boom, 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 boom. And it wasn't just a boom, boom, boom of the uh, consensual action happening next to me. There was also the noise that comes along with lovemaking. Um, the noise of fluids passing between bodies which was really weird to hear between walls. And I'm just like, okay, either you guys are doing something I've never heard of or seen before, or these walls are really thin. Well, luckily it only lasted about five or six minutes. Yay, thankfully. And you know, I drifted off to sleep. Next day I had this massive hike planned. I was gonna go to Land's End, which is the very west point of England hike along the coast for a long way, go see a bunch of stuff. I think it was like a 30 kilometer hike. And these aren't easy hikes. You're hiking up and down hills, you're hiking in fields. So there's not a hard pack trail. Like it's a, it's such a beautiful hike, but you earn your distance, you earn your miles. So after I finished the hike, you know, I was driving back into the hotel and grab some food from the grocery store. Cause I'm just like, I can't be bothered to go eat food with people. I just want to, you know, make myself something, even if it's just cold cuts, sandwich, some fruits, and get to bed. So I get back to my room, take a shower, and as I'm in the shower, I hear this woman and her daughter having a conversation as if they're right next to me. And I'm like, did someone just come in my room? What's going on here? And so I hear them next door. I was tired. My head was hurting. I was massively dehydrated. I was hungry. So I put my towel around me, go knock on their door, and I'm like, hey, guys, I can hear you very clearly. I'm so sorry. We'll try to keep it down. Instead, they made it much louder. So I go down to the hotel desk, and I'm like, hey, is there something wrong with my room? Like, last night I heard pretty um, pretty loud interactions happening between a, uh, a man and a woman. And today I'm hearing a clear conversation and they're just like, 
oh no, our, our hotel, this is how it is. We're a very open and welcoming place. And if you can't handle the noise, then you shouldn't have booked with us. You see, they weren't very nice to me, um, which is not uncommon. Because I have an accent that is not from Europe or the UK, I do get a lot of feedback like this quite often. So I'm like, oh, well, is there any room quieter? You know, I've been out on a massive hike today and I just really want to get to bed and sleep and not have to deal with, you know, hearing these conversations. And they didn't want to move my room, which is, you know, up to them. It's their business. And so I was like, okay, you can do this. I've done similar things before. I'm like, hang in there. You're not in London. You can do this. So I go out to my car, I bring all of my bedding from the room, bring the pillows. And luckily the car company, I don't know, they gave me a free upgrade and I was driving this massive SUV. So I laid down all the back seats and I basically had a double bed to lay in. So I made a massive car bed, um, set up everything and I just passed out in the car, you know, woke up at 4 a.m. and there was the most beautiful stars in the sky. I was a little bit cold, a little bit hungry, had to pee, but you know, I got the best sleep. I went up into my room um, cause I was like, no, I can sneak up into the room. Everyone's probably sleeping by now. Absolutely not. You could hear conversations going on. People were snoring, people were still partying. And I'm like, this is gonna be a disaster. So the next day I had planned to do another little hike um, going into Plymouth. Plymouth, as you may know, if you're watching this from North America, it's where one of the ships sailing to North America left to bring a settlement of people who wanted to practice a certain sect of religion into a new country. So the Plymouth, the pilgrims, like all of that happened from this place I was going to. I wanted to see it. So I went out there in the day, did my hiking and that sort of stuff. And then I came back, same thing super loud and I'm like well I guess it's gonna be another car camping night very expensive at 300 pounds a night car camping night so at that point I was like you know what this isn't for me I think that I should just go back to London because I'm not gonna be happy here I'm gonna be sleeping in a car I can't get sleep I can't enjoy this massive room that I thought I booked which is just a tiny little room so I'm just gonna go back to London so I turned my car in, I hopped on a train, and it was the best decision I ever made. I went back to London. I enjoyed every single second I had out of London, but I realized that my sleep and my sanity and people being nice to me were way more important than me getting out of London. Okay, if you can't hear, my voice is dying. It left me about two weeks ago and it hasn't come back yet, so water break okay that's a little bit better so that is a horror story that didn't work out so well now let's talk about a story that oh i have a good story for you this is an amazing story so one of my favorite hotels in the world it's a chain called citizen m and citizen m the m stands for mobile and they're all about being a mobile citizen and being a world traveler. And they're in pretty big destinations. They're in Glasgow, they're in London, New York, Paris, Amsterdam, Copenhagen, big locations where you have a lot of uh, business travelers going. And I like to call it an up, 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 what is it? upscale, up market, upscale. I know one language and I can't think of the word. An upscale market for, you know, travelers age like 25 to 45, 50. It's a very cool vibe. So how Citizen M works is in every room, there's this massive king bed. So it's like, I don't know how big, it's just massive. The biggest bed I've ever seen in my life. They have super comfy pillows. My love fit that they have blackout curtains. Not just like a <laughs> curtain, but Sweden grade blackout curtains to keep the light out. So if you're jet lagged, if you're staying in a northern location, if you're doing any of that, it's always dark at night. They have a shower that has lights in it. You control the heating and the temperature and the TV, all with this little iPad thing. There's electrical outlets for UK, European, and North America plugs. So if you don't have an adapter, you're fine. 
the downstairs of Citizen M, there's always what they call a living room. There's couches, there's little places to do work, there's focus areas, all sorts of books to read, art to look at. It is the coolest immersive environment where you can be alone in your room, you can go into the co-living space with other people. There's always a bar that's open from like, I don't know, early a.m. to late p.m. There's a 24-hour menu, best hotel ever. And no, this video is not sponsored by Citizen M. Although, hey, Citizen M, if you get this and ever want to sponsor me, sign me up because I would love to promote you. I love your hotels. So, one day I was going into the Citizen M. Super excited to stay here. It's one of my most favorite Citizen M's. And I'm not going to say the location because it was like the story is hilarious. So I get there and they have the most amazing staff that work for Citizen M. They're like, hey, how's it going? Do you know how to check in? And I'm like, yeah, I'm great. How are you? When you check in at Citizen M, you basically just punch in your code like you would at an airport. And then you do it all yourself with this terminal. And then you swipe your own key card and they print you out a receipt with your room number. So I'm talking with the um, person who helps people check in. There was no one else there. And, you know, I pay for my hotel, pick my room. Oh, yeah, you get to pick your room, too. Do you want a high floor? Do you want a low floor? Do you want a accessible room that's even a little bit bigger? Like, you have all of these options. It's great. So I picked my room, and then it prints me out my room number. And I'm like, awesome. I'm like, it's great talking with you. I'll see you around, I'm sure. So get my luggage and I go upstairs to my room and the room card doesn't work. Room card doesn't work. And I'm like, oh man, there's only one elevator working and the room card doesn't work. Oh well. Get back in the elevator or wait for five minutes to wait for the elevator to come pick me up. Get back in the elevator, go downstairs. And I'm like, I think I killed my card already with, because sometimes my phone has this magnet on it and sometimes it kills cards that have RFID chips. I think I killed my card. And she's like, ah, oh, no worries, let's redo it. So she goes and redoes it. She's like, okay, good luck. Go back upstairs. Tap, 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 doesn't work. And a couple rooms down, there was this nice guy working on some of, like, just interior decoration for another one of the rooms. And he saw me the first time. He sees me again. He's like, why are you here again? And I'm like, it won't let me in. He's like, okay, stop hauling your stuff up and down. Like, this is, this is silly. I'll open the room for you, put your stuff in here, and then go downstairs and figure out your card. And I'm just like, oh, I love Citizen M. This is so amazing. Thank you so much. Go back downstairs. And when I got down there that time, it had been about probably 30, 45 minutes since I got to the hotel. And more people were coming in and checking in. And the hotel person, um, I had to wait a couple of people in line because there was other people, you know, waiting for them to help out. So I'm down there and I'm second in line, finally. And the guy in front of me is like, hey, I just went to my room and someone's stuff is in there. I'm like, wait, what? That's really weird. Because my room key wouldn't open. And she's like, oh, okay, well, what room number are you in? And he lists off the room number and I look at my receipt and I'm like, that's my room too. And I'm like, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt, but that's my room. And that's probably my stuff because, and then he just cuts me off and he's like, why do I have the same room card as you? How, how, how do I know that's your stuff? And I'm like, no, no, no. There's the super nice maintenance guy. And he let me in because he felt sorry for me because my card wouldn't work to open the room. And the other guy was like, well, why is my card working? And why is your not card not working? And he just could not figure out how I got my stuff in his room. He also didn't realize that we have the same room ticket. Well, as we're talking, like the desk person listening to us is just laughing. She couldn't figure out what was going on. She's just like, what? Two other people come downstairs and they're like, hey, we were trying to go enter the same room at the same time. We think something's wrong. So there's four of us standing there and the computer gave us the same room to share. And I'm just losing a laughing. I think I'm like the only person in the hotel who's just finding so much humor out of this. I'm like, guys, we're roommates. Yay, we get to share this room together. And they're just like, what is this crazy person doing? Like, we don't understand this. So the, uh, the desk person goes and looks and she's like, yeah, I think that, 
something's wrong with our computer. She's like, I'm just going to try to check in someone else really quick. And the computer just kept putting us all in the same room. And she's like, okay, we're going to do this manual for now. So everyone was like, do not stick me in that room. And she asked me, she's like, do you want to be in that room? And I'm like, well, I prefer not. But if you want to stick me in that room, go for it. Like, it's not your fault the computer's messed up. You do whatever you think is right. And she's like, yeah, I'm not going to stick you there. So none of us stayed in that room. And then the funny thing is, like, the next day, two other people had the same problem happen to them. I was just walking outside the door, and then I hear overhear the conversation. I'm just rolling in laughter. So that's a hilarious story on how some crazy stuff can happen when you're there. Um, yeah, the moral of that story is just be chill. Like, some of these stories you can't make up. And stuff always works out. Like, hotels always have room. And if they don't have room, then they always have partner hotels that they can help find you a place somewhere else. So I loved my experience in that hotel just because, yeah, it was so, so random and funny. Um, okay, we have time for me to give you one more story. I have a story for you now of when I stayed in Albania. Now... If you've been to Albania, you probably already have encountered this. Or if you've been to any parts of the Balkans, you've probably already encountered this. In my time in Albania, I'd never been there before. And the reason I went there was because I hadn't been there before. And I didn't know anything about Albania. And I was like, let's learn. So I go to Albania. And in Albania, um, I booked a hotel that looked pretty nice online. Later, I found out it was where all the communist leaders stayed. So... It had this smell to it, and I didn't understand what the smell was. Well, there is a smell that is associated with Soviets and communists, and the reason for that is that there was a certain line of cigarettes, a certain line of perfume, a certain line of clothes, a certain line of everything that they all used. Not bad, not good. It would, it like, it just has this smell. Um, so on top of having that smell, it was also a smoking hotel. Even though they claimed it was a non-smoking hotel. I'm very okay if people smoke, if they don't smoke, if they vape, if they do whatever. But the thing is, just don't do it inside. You see, particle, like smelling particles that you smell, they're actually particles. It's not a scent. A scent is a particle. And those particles get stuck in stuff. So they get stuck in wallpaper and in carpet and fabrics and pillows which is why whenever you meet someone on the train or in public and you're like, oh, they really smell like smoke. It's actually particles of something that's stuck to them is what you're smelling and what's getting in your nose and mouth. So I go into my hotel room and it was the most coolest hotel room I've ever been in. Like if you imagine something that is from, I don't know, 1950s, maybe from, I don't know, like it's very cool, red carpet, gold and red weaven wallpaper, gold fixtures in the bathroom, massive tub with gold feet. I had a patio, like a smoking patio, right? There would go out, there was two chairs, massive door that opened to get out, ceilings that were probably four or five meters tall. Beautiful room. It smelled like someone had smoked five packs of cigarettes about two minutes before I entered the room. I'm a very seasoned traveler, and I'm like, you know what? You've dealt with worse. You can do it. You're only here for a little bit of time. Embrace the experience. Embrace the exposure that you have here. And then, as I'm sitting there, smelling the smoke, as my eyes are starting to run, as my lungs are starting to close, I'm starting to get hives on my neck. I'm just like, I can't do this. So I go downstairs and I ask the front desk person, I'm like, is there a non-smoking room? Oh no, you have non-smoking room. Smoking's illegal, it's a hundred year old fine. And I'm like, no, no, it's, it's a smoking room in there. And you can see my neck, you can see my eyes, like everything is closing. And she was very firm with me that it was a non-smoking room. And it may have been, but it also may have been a very much smoking room from the person who stayed there before. And I, you know, mentioned to her, I'm like, listen, I, I really can't breathe and my lungs are closing up. And she's like, okay, well, fine. I will come and inspect your room. She wasn't very excited about it. 
and I think that she thought I was being a little bit too Western for, um, too Western and too picky for what I was staying at. But I'm like, you know what? If she wants to think that I'm an old lady who wants some pristine whatever, like, go for it, man. I'm not going to show you the things I've stayed in. So I go and take her up to the room and she walks in the room and her face just turned white. She's like, oh. Well, clearly someone has smoked in this room very recent and it's not just one cigarette and I'm like told you I didn't say that and she's like do you need medical attention like she's like I can call a nurse I can call an ambulance I'm like no no I'm fine I just need to get you know out of this and I can't sleep in this tonight and she's like okay well I'll see what I can do goes downstairs and she's like okay here's what we can do I need to adjust your reservation and this and it's gonna cost you this much more but I can move you to this other room I guarantee no one smoked in it. Um, I don't want to know why she knows no one smoked in it before. Like, that's fine. So I go to the very top floor in this awesome hotel. The room is massively bigger. There's like a seating lounge. There's a desk area, you know, same bathroom features as before. The bed is twice as big. The only thing it didn't have was a smoking patio. But my guess is that she knew no one had smoked in that room because there was really no accessibility to smoke. I don't know. The room also didn't overlook the old communist building. It overlooked, you know, some apartment buildings behind the door. And I was like, that's fine. I love looking at old buildings that are just very cool and beautiful and pretty. So she puts me in this room. And the room did smell like someone had smoked in it. it smelt a little bit of that old Soviet smell that you get. Um, but it was... It was very cool. And just for, for my viewers, before you go crazy, I know Albania was never part of the USSR. It's just the brand of products. And being from the West, we didn't have those smells growing up. And so for us, it's a very distinct smell. I find it very cool. And I'm saying this in the most very cool way. Like, history is awesome. And I think the fact that smell still holds history from you know 50 60 70 years ago it's fascinating how this world works so that room i was staying in smelled of history awesome i'm like i can handle this still had hives still had allergies but at least i wasn't dying and i could sleep so that is another story of how sometimes stuff works out it's a little bit rocky always to negotiate these things and sometimes when you're in a new country, in a new place, you don't know what you're getting yourself into. I have so many more of these stories on random places I've stayed, on stuff that works out, on stuff that doesn't work out. So if you want to hear more stories about hotel horror stories or Airbnb horror stories, uh, drop a comment. Let me know. And I will make this a little bit of a series because I've stayed in a bunch of places and I have a bunch of awesome stories of when stuff always seems to work out because I am here. So with that, I am going to let you get on with your day or I hope you're taking a little jog on this. I would love to be a podcaster that people listen to when they go for a run. So enjoy your run. Enjoy the rest of your day. Like, subscribe, share, drop a comment if you want to. And thanks for watching. I, thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. Thanks for being here with me and listening to my stories. I will see you next time where we will talk about something very cool. Ciao. Sparkles!